Hey everyone, I'm David, and I recently had the pleasure of interviewing my friend and mentor, Miss Nancy Rumble, a fellow ocarina player and a Grammy-winning recording artist who has released 20 albums over the past 30 years, along with her partner Eric Tingstad as Tingstad and Rumble. During the interview, I asked Nancy about her musical upbringing, how she got started in the music industry, and what her advice is for ocarina players, composers, and new musicians. Please enjoy. I did want to ask you about that, like your upbringing yeah. in San Antonio and with music. Like, what was your life like there before you moved up here to Seattle, and what was your musical training? Well, my mother was a musician. She's a piano player, so I had music in the house from the get-go, because mm -hmm. she played a lot. She would play every night when my sisters and I would go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she had a really strong work ethic about practicing, and if you were interested in music, uh, I started piano with her when I was really young. And then switched around fifth grade to clarinet for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then in middle school, I started the oboe, and I have stuck with that ever since. And the ocarina didn't really come into my life till I had uh, moved to the East Coast and had a friend who had purchased at a craft fair, a public radio craft fair in New York City, a double wooden ocarina. Oh. It's one of Alan Albright's ocarinas, and I bought it, fell in love with it, and been playing ever since. That's awesome. So, did you, you attended college for music? I did. I had actually done some summer classes in education and became very interested in a more radical type of education. Mm. And I was also becoming very interested in world music at that point. So we're talking, this is like 1970, 1971, okay. before your time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so it was really exciting to be he hearing music from other cultures. Well, and having grown up in San Antonio, mm -hmm. I had that background of not only having classical music, but also country music, Hispanic music, rock music, marching band music, yeah. jazz down at the landing. I mean, there were a lot of different influences in San Antonio, which I don't think I really realized until I was a little older. Mm -hmm that they really were formative in what my musical tastes were about and how much I appreciated so many different styles of music. Right. Yeah. So anyway, when um, I left school, I began to pursue other avenues of performing music and playing. And so I became a dance accompanist oh, for okay. a number of years. Mm -hmm. And I played piano for ballet classes. And then I also played uh, my oboe for uh, modern dance classes and percussion, so I did some hand percussion and things. But again, that's all pre-Ocarina. Sure. So the Ocarina wasn't until I moved out to the East Coast. Gotcha. And was it, did you decide to pursue music professionally before you got the Ocarina, or, or was oh, yeah. that after? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what kind of inspired you to, I mean, is it just something you've always wanted to do, like from yeah. a young child? Yeah. That's good. It was just kind of from the get-go. I love music, and I really felt inspired by performances. I went to a lot of live performances, mm -hmm. all different kinds. And again, that was something that my mother encouraged. So mm -hmm. she would take us to a lot of different live performances of all different kinds of music, too. So I was participating in playing at my church. There were a choir, so I sang in my choir. Mm -hmm. I was in Girl Scouts, and we had a really active singing troupe. We played ukuleles, wow. and we all sang. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could have been ocarinas, but it wasn't. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it was a lot of music all the time. And that seemed to be the service that I was supposed to be doing. So eventually you met Eric Tinstad, who is your mm -hmm. partner, and you collaborated, like I said, on those many of those albums together. Yeah. How did you meet him for the first time? Well, prior to that, actually, I played with a national group called Paul Winter Consort. Okay. So I was in that band that was based on the East Coast, and we did a lot of touring across the country and recording okay. as well. And we performed in Eugene, Oregon, and at that particular event, I met uh, the person who was going to become my husband. Hmm. So when I married Ron and moved out from the East Coast to the West Coast, then I was beginning to, you know, continue performing, and I was performing with the guitarist who was in, with the Paul Winter concert at that time. Yeah. And we did a concert in the same exact place in Eugene where I met my husband, awesome. and Eric was playing, and I met Eric backstage. <laughs> well, Eric was looking for a person to play some music with. He was doing solo guitar, mm -hmm. and 
through a mutual friend had heard that I had moved out to the area. So he contacted me and um, we just kind of, actually, our first release was over Christmas music. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had done a lot of that as a child mm -hmm. in my church I was talking about that I grew up in. And I loved the repertoire. Eric didn't really know very much Christmas music because he was raised Baha'i. Okay. So it was really interesting. I was able to give a lot of input into songs, mm -hmm. into uh, instrumentation that I thought might be fun to play with. Sure. So we did our first release was The Gift okay. that came out in 85. Gotcha. Did you already decide that you wanted to become a deal at the point or was it after that one was released? You know, it was after that because the response to it was so strong mm -hmm. that we realized, hey, you know, we kind of got a unique sound going here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that has a lot to do when you see that there's some sort of support for what you're doing that right. you might be headed in the right direction. Yes. After a number of years, you actually won a Grammy for one of your, your albums. Was there ever uh, a point where you were aiming to be recognized to that degree to where you reached the just kind of happiness. No, no, it was a big shock. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was exciting. One of the of course highlights of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but we had been signed to a record label early on in our career, mm -hmm. and normally record labels enter the releases into the Grammy. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know that we submitted it. I think our record label did. Huh. Okay. Uh, so it was kind of one of those things where when we were nominated, we were totally shocked and surprised. Yeah. Um, a friend of ours called, actually. You know, we, it wasn't like we actually even knew we were nominated. Just somebody called us. And then we just, you know, went to the award show, which was the last year they had it in New York City. So it was um, in the winter of 2003. And it was at Madison Square Garden. Wow. And it was beyond our wildest expectations. When they called our name, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> what has been your, um, I guess, your fascination with the instrument? What made you decide to incorporate that in your music? Well, be because the instruments I picked up was a double ocarina. Yeah. So, and it's it's a double four-hole ocarina. So, they were made by Alan Albright at that time. And I might not have been so fascinated if I hadn't had the harmony. Oh, okay. So it was the harmony of this instrument and the quality of the tone and craftsmanship that really drew me in. Because by that point, I was already a professional musician, mm -hmm. and I had certain standards that I wanted to have met if I was going to devote time to an instrument. And his instruments seemed to really speak to me, and I thought they were fun, and it was a nice balance with an oboe and English horn, mm -hmm. which is a much different embouchure, and is also has its own little problems like, you know, making reeds, and it's, you know, the, the little ocarina you could just pick up and blow, and it was ready to go. Yeah, the simplicity of it. <laughs> exactly. That's one of the beauties of it, definitely. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. During your career, have you noticed um, any sort of attitude from from your listeners or for, from the music industry towards the ocarina, like, oh, that's weird, or that's really interesting or fascinating? Like, what has been the general reception? Well, it's just gotten more and more popular. Yeah. You know, when I first started out, there was really very little uh, knowledge of the instrument except for very elderly people in the audience mm -hmm. because of the instruments that were used in World War II. Right. You yeah. know, and they sometimes would bring me instruments and they would go, oh, I know, sweet potato, that's what you're talking about. Right. Even though Alan's instruments were different, so they weren't like the old clay instruments, his were wooden instruments. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, as Zel after Zelda came out, there were more and more younger people in the audience that I'd say, does anybody know what this instrument is? And maybe, you know, a, a child would raise her hand and say, I play Zelda, or I know what this is. And, and so that became more and more frequent right. as I got, you know, older. Um, so it's been fun to see the popularity of the instrument grow 30,000 fold in the United States. <laughs> Let's switch gears to, um, for people who are like trying to create more music for the ocarina, what inspires you to write music in general? You know, I think getting to a quiet place is a good spot, spot to start. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of just being in a place where you've got time to focus on music. Um, maybe you've got your ocarina with you, and maybe you have a certain kind of a for lack of a better word, a lick that you play that's a few notes that you like to go over and over with that is your signature sound or a signature little motif that you play. 
And then from there, you might expand on it, maybe go a couple notes above it, a couple notes below it, experiment with the rhythm, and find basically kind of the voice of your instrument. Mm -hmm. And you know how every ocarina has kind of got its own personality? Yeah, their own quirks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of finding what really sits the best on the instrument, uh, and then playing around with it, I think, is how I enjoy you know, composing using the ocarina as the basis. Sometimes I'll use the keyboard first, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe find out, okay, is this going to sit on the ocarina well? Oh no, maybe I have to shift it to a different key. Right. We were talking a little, <laughs> little about this before, but I have a huge appreciation for music education. I know you do too, from our music backgrounds. So a lot of my fans are just beginning music through the ocarina. Yeah. So what do you recommend for people who are just starting off, who have no foundation in music, but they're really interested in getting started? Like, what are some general tips for becoming a better musician? Well, again, finding a good place to practice. And I think sometimes that, you know, if your family members are not supportive of what you're doing, you may have to go somewhere else to practice. Uh, and it may not be in your house, but if you're really dedicated to your instrument, find a good place to play. Mm -hmm. And you can really find some great places that have good acoustics. Sometimes even in your house, you might go in your shower. Uh, there's sometimes, and, and then the tone sounds really pretty and you enjoy what you hear, mm -hmm. and then that makes you want to practice more. Uh, maybe finding a time of the day where you can play that you feel that uh, you'll know, you'll give yourself, maybe in the beginning, 15 minutes. Maybe it's only 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and then it'll increase. All of a sudden, you'll find yourself playing for a couple hours. So, uh, you know, kind of starting slowly, giving yourself permission to try new things. And if you really love the instrument, again, seeking out a place where you can practice and not be disturbed. That's mm -hmm. a, another one. Turn yeah. your phone off. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the computer off. And then for the opposite end of the spectrum, the people who are more advanced and maybe looking to do this professionally, music as a living, mm -hmm. any advice for them? Ask questions. Make connections with each other. I mean, David and I, it's been great how our relationship's grown over the years and we'll bounce information back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and constantly seeking out information from people that are better musicians than you are or have more experience. Maybe it's engineers, maybe it's producers. Could be people playing in totally different fields of music than what you do, but they are all bringing something to the music party in terms of their experience or what they found. Mm -hmm. And because the ocarina is such an individual instrument and so uh, unique, there's not a lot of people that have blazed the trail ahead of us, so mm -hmm. we're kind of still pioneering ourselves. Uh, and that's why you really do kind of have to check with some other people about, okay, what did you find was useful when you perform, or what kind of repertoire are you playing that, that you find works? Mm -hmm. If people want to find your work online, how can they do that? You can go to, you know, iTunes, the information's there. I, I've never posted anything on Spotify, but I think it's all over Spotify. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. You just put the base thing, is, you know, just Google it. I have my own website. Mm -hmm. Which is? NancyRumble.com. <laughs> Guys, please, please, please go check out Nancy's work. She is an incredible musician, and her music has uh, inspired me the last couple of years to, to write and just uh, live life. So Yeah, well, thank you for having me. I'm great that we're still getting together, and I'm sure we will. Yes. Our, our, my hair's turning white, and yours is still dark. 